Hey, everyone, welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com focused on keeping you informed on all the latest financial news and ideas you need to know. I'm your host today, J.D. Durkin. We are here to discuss the world of volatility as markets continue to reach new highs. As always, do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more in-depth interviews to help keep your portfolio on track. Today, we are here with Chris Sidiol. Chris is the co-CIO of the Ambrose Group. Chris, thanks a lot for taking the time. Nice to have you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I think this one should be uh, should be a cool one. So market enthusiasm here is high, as we know, the S&P 500 surpassing not too long ago, the 5,000 point milestone. The Dow seeks uh, the 40,000 marker. Uh, we certainly see what the tech heavy NASDAQ has done on the back of a lot of these key consolidated big tech growth AI names. Investors may be vaguely aware, Chris, of the term volatility because we use it a lot. And then, of course, we follow the the fear index or the VIX. But talk to us more about the inner workings there uh, in terms of where you're positioned and how you think we should all view the overall theme of volatility. Yeah, you know, so I'll give a little color on what we do as a firm. So uh, we do what you call carry neutral tail risk hedging. Um, and that could sound a little bit complex, but it's much, much more simpler than that. And pretty much what it boils down to is when markets are going down and things become very volatile, we look to have this really large return, this asymmetric return. Uh, but there, is, if there is no volatility, we're using a lot of short term uh, proprietary trading to be flat. Right. So you'll have investors that will come to us as pretty much a hedge in their portfolio. Right. So markets go down. They have this thing that can make a lot of money and protect them from the other pieces in their portfolio that may lose money. So when you think currently about the volatility landscape, we could look at something like the VIX. Right. So the VIX can be looked at as a strip of SPX options. That's inherently variance. But really what that means is that it's, it's the expectation as to what the market believes is going to happen over a certain time period. So the VIX measure is mainly 30-day vol, but you can annualize this. So if you see something, let's say VIX is at 16, right? Right now it's around 14-ish or so. But if VIX is at 16, what that's saying is that over a one-year time horizon, market participants believe the S&P may be down or up within a 16% band. And if you look towards a daily move, that could translate to roughly about 1% on a daily move. So when you think about volatility right now, I think uh, usually when people generally think of volatility, they think, well, markets need to go down for volatility to go up, right? But over the last few weeks, what we've been seeing is a lot of upside call buying in the S&P and obviously the S&P rallying to all time highs, but also a sustainable bid in vol, which we haven't seen for a really long time. So if you look at volatility, it's slowly grinding up. And really that could be what you call two-way vol, where the market starts to believe that, hey, we may be setting up for a pullback or simultaneously we may be setting up for more upside volatility. So I think right now, you're seeing this little bit of correlation break where markets going higher and market participants are also thinking that there's going to be some more uh, two-way volatility going on. And what are some of the best ways, Chris, for investors to track volatility in the markets, even aside from the uh, all the attention that the VIX itself gets? Yeah, you know, so you could look at, like, let's say if you're a, a trader that mainly focuses on short-term things, you could look at the pricing of a straddle, right? So if you say what let's think in S&P terms, right? You look at the S&P and you say, well, and I'm just trying to back into this for easy math. If the S&P is at $100 and the call is priced at $5 and the put is priced at $5, right? That's $10. So that's a 10% implied move. And you could look at something like that and say, well, you know, over the next day, do I believe that the S&P is going to go up or down within 10%, a 10% range, right? So, you could look at certain metrics like that. You could look at things like outside of the VIX, you could look at just uh, floating strike volatility. So you could say, okay, well, what if I look at an S&P put by itself and say, hmm, if the S&P goes down 10%, I want to protect my holdings. So you could go back and you could say, what is the implied volatility on a one month 10% out the money put? And what does that look like historically? Right? And today, if you look at volatility 
today. Historically, we're seeing some of the cheapest pricings in the vol or in the US listed uh, derivative ecosystem. So Mm. when you think about these out the money options, you're able to purchase them today, especially the short term ones like one month, two months, you're able to purchase them at prices that are significantly less than what you would have been able to purchase them for in a year like 2022 or 2021 or mm-hmm. or even later on in 2020. Chris, are, are there, we'll get more into the VIX here in just a moment, but I, I wonder, are there kind of more preferred gauges that you like to follow aside from the VIX? Obviously, we put a lot of attention on it, but I'd have to imagine where your position in terms of tracking vol, you've got a lot of cool instruments and indexes that I'm sure you're following that maybe the average investor may not even know is out there to follow. Yeah, you know, so I would say what we do is more so in-house. So we're tracking things like uh, floating strike vol, like what I just said, historically. Um, we're tracking the volatility term structure and the volatility surface and looking at certain ways that it's moving and trying to identify crowded positioning that exists there. We're trying to understand other market participants and why they're doing certain things at certain times, right? I think it's important for people to always understand it's all supply and demand based, right? So if you see a lot of activity for call buying, that's probably indicative of you know, market sentiment to an extent. So we look at fixed strike vol, floating strike vol, things like that, historical vol. Um, you know, but I would say probably on an index level, the number one index that uh, maybe retail participants can look at that that we actually give a little bit of credence to is is uh, something like VVIX, which is effectively vol of vol. So as we talked about before, you looked at. Uh, or when we spoke about fix, fix is a strip of SPX options, right? And the calculation that goes into that methodology is very similar to based on what VVIX is to VIX. And I know that may sound confusing. So it's like SPX, all right, you have SPX vol, VIX measures that, and VVIX vol measures VIX. <laughs> right? Right. So where this becomes impactful is because what you can do is you can look at the pricing of VVIX, which is that index, and you could say, well, how expensive or how cheap are VIX options? So right now, when you look at that index, it's pretty low, mm-hmm. right, historically. So what this is telling you is that the cost of hedging using VIX options may be significantly cheaper than another time period if, if you go back. So for an investor, think about, think about how this may make sense. You may say as an investor, you say, okay, well, I believe over the next two months, the S&P is going to go down. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to buy S&P puts or do you want to buy VIX calls? And how do you measure that? So you could look at something like VVIX compared to VIX, right? So VVIX measures the price of vol on VIX and Mm -hmm. VIX measures the price of vol on S&P. There is definitely a lot of moving pieces, but I got to give you credit because you really break it down in a very easy to understand way. So I do appreciate that. (laughs) Uh, As for the regular VIX, the the VVIX aside, the VIX itself, as we know it and love it and follow it, priced below $15. You said it's it's now around pre-pandemic levels. I remember, you know, last year and I think really around those kind of um, towards the end of 2022, we really saw that number was up, you know, north, well north of 20 again. That index previously reached levels north of, of $60 when the pandemic first began to emerge. We're certainly nowhere near that. Uh, how does economic uncertainty come into play overall for market volatility? And I, and I wonder if, if, if the future economic story is a bit more cloudy uh, or a bit more uncertain. How does that directly elevate volatility in these concerns? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing that we need to think about is historically, where does the VIX generally price? And it's roughly around that 13 to 16 range is where on average, historically, the the VIX will will price at. So if you look at it right now, um, I would say volatility, although there's a lot of vol selling going on, I'd say in comparison to realized volatility is somewhat fairly priced, right? Can't really say it's mega low just in that in that respect or mega high or rich in in that respect. So when you think of the way how market participants start digesting economic data and forward forecasts, it could be very different as to what's expressed in volatility because the VIX generally is a measure of 30-day vol. So if you think about a year like 2022, it was a year that 
the S and P certainly did go down a lot. You know, it went down over twenty percent. But if you look at what the VIX did, it never really got over thirty, right, for a sustainable time period. So when you look at that and you compare it to a year like twenty twenty, where the VIX went to eighty six. You know, you look at it and you say, well, why in one environment the VIX went to 86 and the other environment, the VIX barely budged. Mm -hmm. And it's really because of how extreme or how offsides market participants are to require them to reach for that type of hedging. So in a year like 2022, where the market slowly grinds down, there was never really a time period where market participants started panicking. Right. It was a very sustainable grind down. Whereas when you think of February or March of 2020, market participants were panicking. The world looked very different at that point in time because we weren't sure if, you know, there, there were going to be lockdowns for a year, or two years. How did that affect the, the GDP? How did it affect the, the global GDP? Right. Um, so when you think about the VIX and we think about what the market's expectations are, it's important to note that it's a measurement of that short time period and that, I guess, panic, panicky, right? They call it the fair index mm -hmm. um, and that ability to go out there and, and really try to, to aggressively buy protection. Now, when you think it, of, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, oh, oh, no, no, I can finish. And I got a broader question on the VIX after, go ahead. So one thing I was going to say, which is pretty special about this year is that in an election year, when you look at the way how volatility is priced, there's generally a kink in the term structure in that part of the election. So right now, if we look at, uh, volatility, we may look at the VIX and say, okay, the VIX is at 14. But mechanically, what ends up happening, let's say if we just skipped like five months or so, right? We, per, we just magically skip five months and we go mm -hmm. into that time period of September, October. As the index starts mechanically repricing the vol to that part of the, the term structure, VIX is naturally going to rise because the market is already naturally bidding volatility in that October, November timeframe, because market participants expect that during a US election, there's gonna be more volatility. Mm -hmm. So it presents this really cool, you know, opportunity to trade volatility where mechanically, the way how the pricing works, it's gonna roll into this part of the term structure that's naturally gonna lift volatility up. Is the fear index a good thing to call the VIX or is there a better way that we should be phrasing it? I feel like that's kind of like the shorthand that we use to kind of explain it simply. But I feel like as you're positioned, maybe there's better descriptions, I wonder. You know, I think people could get uh, very subjective with how they look at it. Um, but, but I think the fear index is something that's that's uh, that's quite fair, I guess, to say, <laughs> because because um, it's you know, the index starts to reprice higher when you get that that aggressiveness to, to try to hedge and market participants are unsure or, or fearful. Um, some people like to think about vol in liquidity terms. They say, well, the index is a barometer of liquidity when there is no liquidity out there. You know, volatility is going to expand. And I, I agree with that. But for the most part, I think it's kind of easy to understand as, as the fear index. So now let, let's look at the. Uh, fear index or the VIX relative to other bigger macroeconomic news, because when we're there, we look up at the big board and we say, OK, now I see the VIX moving relative to this announcement from the central bank, which I think is a good place to take the conversation. We know how enthusiastic markets have been to kick off the year after the central bank pointed to several short term interest rate cuts at some point in 2024. The debate is on about when we actually get those cuts. And then at the same time, Chris, as you know, then we start to get some not so promising inflation data showing, yeah, we're still kind of a little bit stubborn in some key areas. How could that higher inflation read, something like that, spark greater uncertainty over the overall macro story within the markets? And then what does that mean in terms of the world of vol that you cover so closely? Yeah. So when you think about the way how positioning has changed over the last two quarters in the U.S. equity market, it's been something very fascinating to watch from a behavioral standpoint. You think about that later part of the year, like October, November, and it looked like the outlook was really negative at that point. Then, you know, Yellen came in and there were some change ups that, that took place and CPI data started coming in a lot uh, lighter than, than people expected. And the narrative around a rate cut really started to make its way back. And 
larger institutions, let's call it pension plans and endowments and foundations, they started to realize this and they started switching their allocation base a little bit more. So they started to become a little more heavier concentrated in U.S. stocks. Uh, at the same time, there was a narrative for market participants to latch on to. And that narrative was the growth of AI. Right? So you had things like uh, NVIDIA and, and some of these companies that were really changing the forward forecast as to how the country's growth can can change over the next year or two. And people really started going the bandwagon with that. And as that occurred, more and more people started buying. And then obviously we went to all time highs. So when you think about the positioning today, a large chunk of it is based on the fact that market participants believe that a rate cut was coming. Right. So now if a rate cut isn't delivered, <laughs> What this could mean is it could be a little bit of a shakeup where market participants start to say, you know, maybe we want to release some of the equity exposure because things aren't as uh, sunny as we initially thought. And what that could mean is that they could generally reach for more downside hedging, which in turn would lead to a sustainable bid in volatility and let volatility go higher. Um, but our view is a little bit different. I think our view is that a more, uh, I guess, sustainable vol environment would be if the Fed were to cut interest rates and the market were to continue to go lower on something like that. And to most people, they may say, well, that's, that's crazy, right? Why would that, why would that occur? Um, but when you think about the Fed put, it's really a self-fulfilling prophecy naturally, right? So, people buy into the fact that the Fed is going to cut rates and that in turn drives asset prices higher and that in turn, you know, leads to this large rally. But if a situation occurs where the Fed cuts rates and equity markets go lower on that, when thinking about, you know, tail events, you know, and extreme levels of volatility that could present more of a tail event than something along the lines of like, you know, the Fed not cutting rates or pushing mm -hmm. that that outlook back a little bit further, that could probably bring in uh, more lower levels of, of vol being bid. So, and what I mean by that is maybe we see a VIX going to 20, right, 25, but nothing really where you would see the VIX go to 60 unless there's, you know, extreme, uh, extreme fear in, into the market based on that, that lack of hedging and aggressive uh, positioning. Chris, do you have a particular outlook for volatility, let's say, in, in the near future or the remainder of 2024? How do you see things shaking out? So a big part of uh, what we do uh, is focusing on the volatility ecosystem and understanding market participants and really trying to back out into what they're doing. And one thing that stands out is just how one-sided that short volatility trade has become over the last few years, All right? So when we think about this, there really hasn't been a vol event um, since 2020, right? So four years now uh, since a real type of shakeout in equity volatility. Uh, so I think we're kind of due for that type mm -hmm. of uh, vol event presenting itself. Now, the thing about this is that everybody knows volatility eventually goes up, right? If you could just buy a call on the VIX and you didn't lose money, you would just do that all the time because you could look mm -hmm. at the index and you could say, well, of course, volatility is going to go up. So these these prolonged periods of you know one-sided positioning can last much longer than people generally think. And I think back to a year like 2017, right, where uh, equity vol was being sold all across the board. People started just selling equity vol left and right. And it took a, a year and some change before you had that washout where we got Volmageddon that February 2018, where VIX went to 50, right, all at once. So the way how we think about things is that election years are always fun. You know, we think back to 2008, we think back to, to 2020, um, it generally presents good amounts of equity volatility. Uh, so it's kind of an exciting year, uh, especially because you have a lot of that short volatility exposure just really baked into things right now. 10 points for use of the word Vomageddon, by the way. I love that <laughs> one. That one's, uh, I'm working that one into my future interviews for sure. Uh, let's shift over here, Chris, with our remaining few minutes here in the broadcast. Um, over to how investors can build 
a trading strategy that is effectively using volatility. Break down some various volatility type of strategies and how they can be used or implemented by investors. Yeah, so the beautiful part of the U.S. uh, equity derivatives market right now is that you have accessibility to options on a ton of single stocks at different tenors, uh, different strikes. So it's a beautiful time to, to trade uh, volatility and, and, and express that view through option trading. Um, there are many ways that you could do certain things where you could do something very as simple as saying, well, I want to bet on the price of um, you know, a, an underlying asset going higher, you could buy a call option. Right? You want to bet on the price of it going lower, you could buy a put option. You want to bet against the, 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 the spot move actually taking place versus what the market is implying. You could sell a call, you could sell a put, right? So you could get very creative with these type of uh, trade structures. You could do things like selling a straddle, right? As we talked about earlier and at the money straddle, you could buy a straddle, you could sell a strangle, you know, which is like further out the money, uh, you know, out the money option strikes. You could buy a straddle, uh, sorry, a strangle. <laughs> so there are all these sort of trade structures that you could do. Generally speaking, um, when you think of how a relative value vol trader uh, operates his book, they think in terms of uh, relative value vol trades. So they may say, okay, well, I'm looking at uh, the tech space and I think that NVIDIA volatility is pretty rich. So I'm going to sell volatility on NVIDIA and simultaneously I'm going to buy volatility on the Qs. Right. Mm-hmm. So you end up trading that sort of spread between the two. So if NVIDIA volatility goes lower and, and the Q's volatility goes higher, you make the difference in between that spread there. So there are all sorts of creative ways that people can use options to implement uh, more robust portfolios or, or more uh, sophisticated forms of capturing uh, an edge that, that exists out there. And how about any good risk management strategies that you think investors should keep in mind if this is a world uh, in terms of overall uh, volatility that uh, they want to get more involved with? Yeah, you know, so for what for what we do, uh, you know, it's more so for family offices, high net worth individuals, uh, foundations, institutions like that that will come in to you know, hedge with us. Uh, but for the average, you know, retail investor that may be trading with a, a smaller account, I think it's good to back into what the risk that you're taking is. Right? And always understand that. So if you're, let's say, long in the S and P, you have to say to yourself, well, what happens if the S and P drops twenty percent a month? And you get, as I mentioned, you can get really cute with these type of trade structures. But I generally push back on those type of things when thinking about hedging, um, you know, because you want to make the hedge very understandable, very clean and reliable, right? So you don't want to do something like buy a put spread, right? So imagine you're long the S&P and then you buy a put spread and then it's a, let's say at the money put, and then you sell the 10% out the money put, and then the S&P drops 30%. And then you're losing a ton of money based on the mm-hmm. fact that, you know, you weren't covered in that part of the uh, the distribution. So if you're going to use options to hedge, I think you always want to make it uh, simpler, right? Just outright buying a put, understanding opportunistic times to buy the put, um, using certain forms of quantitative data to understand how to execute buying the put. Uh, so yeah, generally speaking, I would say when it comes to hedging, simpler is always better. <laughs> don't Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Fair enough. My final question for you, I think a lot of investors know, hey, if I'm trying to get myself into the game, I have to do my research. I have to learn. I'm going to read books like The Intelligent Investor or uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, whatever it is. Where can investors go, Chris, to learn more about trading market volatility, books, resources, podcasts, things like that that you recommend people go off to to become a bit smarter before they really embrace this world? Yeah, so... uh you know, for what 
for what we do, it's really two parts. It's it's volatility trading and then the the, the trading side. So so you know, you brought up reminiscences of a stock operator, and I, I love that book because I think it's a fascinating book to think about uh, how to operate uh, as a speculator. But when thinking about more esoteric forms of derivatives, you know, you really do have to understand volatility pricing. You have to understand uh, other market participants and how they tend to think about these things. So. You know, I think uh, you could look up some books by Yuan Sinclair. Yuan's a friend of mine, and I think he's done a fantastic job in putting out some volatility trading books. Um, you know, I think uh, we have some white papers on our website at ambrosgroup.com that lay the land for people to understand the volatility ecosystem. And you know, we d- we talk about things like the VIX. We talk about things like uh, zero DT options and and what that looks like. Um, there's a slew of, of, of resources that, that are out there uh, on the web. Um, so, yeah, I would say, you know, you could, you could look up the very v- vanilla famous volatility books like uh, like uh, Nittenberg's uh, option trading book, things like that. So I would say understand what options are, understand, you know, how, how they're priced. And then uh, once you understand those components, you could go on and think about using them to express certain market views that you have based on certain edges that exist in the market. It's a great interview, man. I, I, I'm really grateful for your time helping us kind of make sense of this world that you specialize in that I know is so important to so many investors. And a lot of people out there who say, I wish I learned a little bit more. I wish I knew a little bit more to be smarter in the space. My special thanks there to Chris Sidiel. He's the co-CIO of the Ambers Group. Chris, thanks a lot for taking the time. Great to have you. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun.